Well, welcome to Podcast 20 of The Cult Movie Show. Yes, Podcast 20. They said we'd never make it, but we have. Yes, we have. I cannot believe it's it's number 20. And I am, of course, Warren, and uh, sitting with me in the virtual studio, as always, Velvet. How are you today, Velvet? I'm doing quite fantastic, and this is going to be a really fun show. We've got, oh my gosh, we've got a creature feature, we've got a straight-up B-movie, we've got an independent horror film, and we're even going to talk about a horror short. So yeah, this is going to be a really fun episode. Oh, it, it is. It definitely is. It's number 20, so I say to everybody, you know, sort of maybe some wine and cheese, I don't know, maybe <laughs> some uh, Scotch and Fig Newtons, uh, mm. or, 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 or I don't know one of your favourites, Velvet, uh, was it Champagne and Donuts? Exactly. Uh, exactly. It's one of those shows, I think. So, uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We've got some great stuff. We, we've got some absolute great stuff. And, in fact, our first cab off the rank uh, for this week, our first movie we really should give a shout out because a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a good friend on, uh, called Andrew, uh, which was podcast 18, I think, if, if I'm correct, Velvet, I think it was number yes. 18. Yep. Yes. Yes. And, uh, he actually said when we were uh, talking about some uh, Japanese movies, uh, when are you going to do, uh, destroy all monsters from the Godzilla franchise? Well, here it is. It's this week, and our first movie is Destroy All Monsters from 1968. And I've got to admit, this is one of my favourite Godzilla movies, uh, Velvet. What, what about you? Oh, bummer. I hate to hear you say that, because I actually really like Godzilla movies, and this is one of those Godzilla movies where everybody's like, oh, if you love Godzilla, you have to watch this movie, and somehow I never got around to it, and now for me, it turned out to be totally overhyped. I did not like this movie. <laughs> I mean, I liked it, but I did not like it as much as I thought I would, so it was kind of like overhyped. It's like you wait too long to see it, and you're excited, and you can't wait, and it never lives up to the hype, so. So for me, it didn't. Do, do, so. do, do, do you think that had a lot to do with the fact that it is from 1968? Um, well, no, I don't. Actually, I don't mind the time period at all. I And we'll get into the reasons why I didn't like this as much as I thought that I would. But it's just, for me, it ended up being overhyped. Okay. That's, that's... <laughs> even the poster, even the poster overhypes it. Even the still photos from the movie overhype it. It just didn't deliver enough of what I was expecting. <laughs> oh, that's, that's interesting. All right, we'll get into that in a minute. But for anyone who hasn't um, seen this, we'll just give you a brief rundown on, uh, on what happens. Now, it's the ninth uh, movie of the Godzilla uh, franchise, which of course started in uh, what was it, 1954, mm -hmm. uh, with Godzilla, uh, the very <laughs> original black and white movie. Uh, so this is, of course, the as we said, the uh, the ninth film, and uh, because it was now you know pretty much getting into the franchise, you know we were well into it. The budget was now really starting to to rise in regards to what they could do, and with this movie, they just decided to really come up with a, an extravagant Ganza. Uh, and that has to be said, because that is what happens. We have 11 mm -hmm. monsters in this. Now, up, mm -hmm. and, up until this movie was made, we had never had 11 monsters, you know, in, mm -hmm. in a single Godzilla film. Now, the basic story is that um, uh, it's set in 1999 in the distant future. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it, well, the distant future in 1968. Anyway, and, uh, and oh, God, does it show. But anyway, um, <laughs> now all the Earth's monsters have been pretty much subdued and captured, and they're now living on uh, an island which is called Monsterland. Yes, believe it or not, it's <laughs> yeah. called Monsterland. And, um, uh, but anyway, some aliens come along and they want to, well, actually, this is kind of weird. They don't want to take over the Earth. They just want to live in a small part of it. And they take control of the monsters and use them to attack various different cities on Earth to blackmail the human race into allowing them to stay. But, of course, us being humans, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to basically shoot first and ask questions later. And so, of course, a war develops between the aliens 
uh, who were called the Killax. I think that's right. The exactly, uh, the yeah, Killax, the Killax. Yeah, you, yeah. Mm-hmm. Who were meant to be from a moon? So, sorry, from a planet somewhere between Jupiter and Saturn, I believe. And <laughs> now I, I, I'm trying to remember my science, but I don't believe there is a planet between Jupiter and Saturn. But oh, um, we just haven't discovered it yet. Uh, I mean, this is yes. 1968. <laughs> <laughs> true, very, very, very true. Uh, um, so, anyway, they take control of the monsters and uh, they're destroying all the cities. Uh, in the end, the humans then basically find out a way to retake control of the monsters and then use them to attack the aliens. Uh, but, of course, the aliens have their own monster and, of course, we get the huge, giant showdown between 11 monsters all in <laughs> one scene. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's pretty much our our, our, our movie. But look, look, I I loved it, Velvet, because it, it was simply mm-hmm. because of the fact it had eleven monsters, and and mm-hmm. that was just unheard of at this stage in the franchise. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So this film was actually, as you mentioned, it's like an all out monster st- extravaganza. So, I mean, it, yeah, that I was excited about. I could not wait to see the showdown. And this was supposed to be at the time, the last Godzilla film they were and they were planning to retire the franchise. But then, of course, this movie was a fucking hit because monsters everywhere. And they were like, oh, well, we can't retire it quite yet now, can we? <laughs> so they kept <laughs> going. But for me, it, it kind of monster squatted on me. By that I mean you yeah. got all you got all the favorites, and it was kind of like here you get to see you can see Godzilla for a few minutes. Although Godzilla had a lot of screen time in this movie, I'll give him that. But everybody else, it was kind of like, oh look, you get to see you get to see Mothra for a second. Up, oh, you get to see Rodan for a second. Oh, there's Gorosaurus. Oh, there's a you know. <laughs> did you see it? Oh, did you catch it? Oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah, I, I, it just didn't satisfy me to the extent that I wanted to. It was always just kind of like, and then some monsters just straight up fucking disappeared for the entire movie, and then they came back towards the end and just popped their head out again, like, hey, hey remember, I'm in this movie too. You see me? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> it, it is a it is a little bit like that. With there are some monsters we don't see at all until the very final battle, and then they just appear. <laughs> Um, you, you know, <laughs> and like, a, like fucking Rodan flew off during the big fight. And then right when the fight ended, he came back. And I'm like, I'm like you fucking asshole. They I, I, your help. Uh, yeah. You I don't off. know what the thing about Rodan was in this movie. I mean, he's some um, like, like there, there is, it starts off with his, of course, a number of the monsters actually attack uh, various cities like, um, uh, uh, mm. oh, I forgot. Here which we go. We got, uh, here. Yeah, here we go. I got it listed for us. Let's see. We had a, but well, now I lost it. I had it written down for us because they have it on the poster so nicely where they're like, Godzilla attacks New York. And then pfft, yeah, I lost it. Sorry. It's, I oh, no, it because I think it's, for from memory, too. I think it's Rodan attacks Moscow. Um, there you I go. think Mothra attacks Beijing. Um, there you go. Uh, uh, Godzilla and attacks who attacked, New York. Who attacked Paris? Who attacked Paris? Oh, I'm the, trying to remember now. Um, uh, I, sorry, Paris. guys, I dropped the ball on this one. I had it and then I lost it. <laughs> oh, was it was it was it Gorgosaurus? I think so. Yeah, I think it's Ted Paris. And you um, know what? If he we digs his kids, way. He would have this memorized. I we know. would have this memorized if we were kids. But he you actually, know, as adults, you kind of. I mean, yeah. he actually digs his way from Monsterland, which is off the this island off the coast of Japan, all the way to Paris underground, and then emerges, <laughs> uh, basically emerges <laughs> under the Arc de Triomphe. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, and the reporters there, it's like, oh no, the Arc de Triomphe, oh no, <laughs> as, as it's destroyed. Um, it's, but, but the other interesting thing too is that Mothra throughout this entire movie is in larval form. Yeah. yeah and I, I didn't, time. I, I didn't get that. What, why didn't he turn into a butterfly? I didn't quite un, or I a thought moth, that was I strange say. too. I was like, did he not have enough time? I mean, how long does he have to be in a cocoon before he becomes Mothra? Like, how long does he need like yeah. a few days? Does he need a week? Does he need a few months? Like, yeah, he was, he was, I was, I was calling him a caterpillar, but you're right. He was, yes, like, he was a larva. Yes. Um, <laughs> I was but, calling him a caterpillar. I was like, <laughs> I was like is Mothra going to be a fucking caterpillar this entire movie? Yes, Mothra is. No, actually a larva, but, but she, uh, she, he, it did a spit, uh, 
uh, fucking web or yeah, whatever the fuck, <laughs> whatever the yes, sexual yes, yes. spit to make their cocoon. <laughs> wow, uh, middle school uh, science and biology. I don't remember any of this shit now. Whatever bugs do to become the next stage of their <laughs> transition. <laughs> well, the interesting, the interesting thing about Mothra in this, apart from not turning into full on Mothra the moth. Um, mm-hmm. The Mothra fairies are not in this movie, even yeah, though Mothra is. Yeah, that's rare. Uh, mm-hmm. Which was because the Mothra fairies are sort of kind of important to the whole character of, of Mothra. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, Mothra in this is just really just almost like an additional extra. It's just a monster thrown in. There's no mm-hmm. because Mothra, like Godzilla, has its very own very real background, you know, story, uh, right. and, all, and all of that is just forgotten about uh, in mm-hmm. this movie. But the other thing, too, is the space monster is, of course, King Kidora, the three-headed uh, monster. And right. um, w- one thing that I absolutely adored about this was the final battle, uh, mm-hmm. you know, between between all the monsters. Because um, in that, this is, and before I say that, I should just say that um, the thing about watching any Godzilla movie is that they're really broken into four different um uh, eras, uh, if you like. There's mm-hmm. 1954 from the very first movie through to, uh, I think it's what, 1975, uh, mm-hmm. which is basically the first franchise. Then the franchise had come back again in 1984 uh, with Godzilla, 1984, with Raymond Burr making a, uh, a guest appearance again. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it would run through until 1995. It would then come back again in 1999 through to 2005, which mm-hmm. was, I think it was Godzilla Final Wars, which is mm-hmm. brilliant, because it's a lot like this movie, actually. It's got so many monsters in it. And, of mm-hmm. course, now we've got the reemergence of the fifth franchise, um, you know, mm-hmm. with, with the latest Godzilla. So, um, But this movie is, of course, in that very first um, franchise. Uh, so mm-hmm. the thing about this is that they're still very campy. Like, for instance... Um, yes. <laughs> if, 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 if Godzilla steps on something and hurts his foot, then he holds his head in pain or, um, <laughs> you know, like, or, or like when, when they're, when, when they're about to do battle, Godzilla will start to flex his muscles or, yeah. you know, um, you know, yeah, you've got yeah. all this sort of stuff in it and you would lose that from 1984 on, you know, mm-hmm. that campiness, the, the monsters now became much more real the stories mm-hmm. became much darker, where in these ones, you know, it, they're much more lighthearted. And yes. uh, and that's what I loved about the battle uh, in this one, because it was like watching an episode of the World Wrestling Federation. <laughs> yes, it is, actually. I did like the final battle, but for me, um, I saw, like, one review of this movie, and the person that made this review... Basically, yeah, said what I should have done. They said, this movie, if you're a Godzilla fan, you definitely want to see it, but just fast forward to the end and watch the battle, because that's pretty much what I got out of this movie. Oh, the battle's great. no, I did, no. I did enjoy the rest of it. Like, I was... I was just kind of like, oh, this, you know, yeah, I just, I just wasn't enjoying it, unfortunately. It's like, I love the ending because, you know, seeing all the monsters battle, King Ghidorah is really fun. But yeah, the whole build up and it was just too much fucking people. Just, yeah. oh, you know, oh, you know, aliens are taking over people and they're making people take over the monsters and they're making the monsters destroy. It just, but it was too much of these aliens, which look exactly like people. And they're, As I always. just, yeah, of course. But I just, yeah, I just didn't enjoy the story for this movie at all. Like, it starts out cool because I like how they introduce you to Monster Island, or excuse me, Monster Land. And it's kind of like, oh, that's cool. And they have it set up and they basically have, what is it? Electronic devices that keep the monsters from escaping. Yes. Monster Land. So, like, you know, you have Rodan flying around, but they have it to where it's kind of like, I guess, kind of like a sonar force field wall that he can't fly past like once he comes in contact with that he's just kind of like ooh, i gotta back off i can't fly through that and you know just being able to control the monsters and it's kind of cool seeing them all just kind of hanging out and getting along you know they're not fighting on this island and godzilla has um, her little baby minya the goofy little play-doh oh, the, looking the, the son of godzilla <laughs> yeah i yes, know the little 
<laughs> the little baby Godzilla that looks goofy as hell. It's just like, yeah, you just want to give him some steroids and a, you know, protein shake and a exercise regimen to build up muscle because he looks so doughy. And just, I know. Like, there's no way. You, there's no way you're going to turn into a, a an adult Godzilla at this rate. You're just like a little doughy Play-Doh toy Godzilla. <laughs> well, the, the, the amazing thing is that even in um, the, the last Oops, Godzilla I'm sorry. Movie, I don't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Or there we go. I hear you now. Sorry. Ah, that's all right. Sometimes that was a technical glitch on my end. I'm sure didn't get the question. Yeah, um, it was just like dead air for ten seconds. Oh no, that's all right. That. Is um mm-hmm. like I mean, for instance, um the closest film there is to this is uh I just mentioned before Godzilla: Final Wars from two thousand and five, which mm-hmm. is a similar story. Um, it was the last of the Godzilla movies to be made until obviously the the one that's just been released now. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, it was uh, much the same. It was aliens trying to take over the world, and they were controlling the monsters, you know, to do their bidding. And then, of course, mm-hmm. there's a big battle, and we've got tons of you know monsters in it in fact i love it too just sydney gets trashed in it which is really cool <laughs> um and of course uh, i don't live in sydney so uh, as an australian i love it when sydney gets trashed <laughs> um but <laughs> um but um it's uh, but it, it's, you know, they're so much more real. You know, they're, uh, as I said, you know, those later movies, mm-hmm. especially at that millennium period from 1999 through to 2005, you know, th- they're using CGI. Uh, the special mm-hmm. effects are, are really quite good. The stories, um, you know, get really in depth where mm-hmm. this one is, it's so simplistic, you know, mm-hmm. in, in how it runs. Um, and, you know, and, and also like the military in this, you can still see that they're little toy remote control tanks and, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Um, you know, where, um, of course, in the later movies, they'll actually, uh, the Japanese self defense force will actually give them tanks and give them planes and all the rest of it, you know, to, to make these movies and they get a lot better. But, um, look, I, I still love it, you know, even for all the cheesiness and, you know, and so forth. I I still love the very early movies because of that camp value that they have that the latter or, or, you know, the current Godzilla movies from about 1984 on lose. And Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Like my favorite camp moment in this movie is again, I'm picking on Minya, the little son of Godzilla, the little goofy looking one. He actually even gets a, he even gets a kill in, on this movie. This, so the whole time he's just kind of like a cheerleader and he's standing off the side and he's like, go, go Godzilla, get him daddy. I know. <laughs> you know? But then he actually gets a kill in cause he, uh, he puffs out a little smoke ring that looks like a little donut and it actually lands around the neck of the enemy and it strangles the monster to death. And I was like, yes, well, baby Godzilla killed somebody. Well, that's, like- <laughs> well, that's the thing. Son of Godzilla can never get that radioactive breath that his father does, you know, like <laughs> it, 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 it yeah, Yes, I know. I know. Oh, uh, it, it reminds me that there's another great Godzilla one, which is called uh, Godzilla, Son of Godzilla, which was the first time we introduced to him. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and and some of the stuff that's in that movie is hilarious because yeah. we, get, we get to see Godzilla teaching his son how to do stuff. He's, like, abusing that child. Oh, but <laughs> some of them... It, <laughs> But, but, but in that movie, there is, in Son of Godzilla, there is almost, there are scenes quite literally where he will try to get his son to do something and he gets it wrong and Godzilla will quite literally look at the camera and what do they call that? You know, was it the fifth wall or the, you know? <laughs> don't they call it the, yeah, they call it, don't they call it the fourth the wall? The fourth wall, sorry, sorry, yeah, fourth, sorry, the breaks fourth, the fourth wall, wall the yeah. audience just and, like. And, and, and he quite literally looks at the audience and just shakes his head like, oh, God, you know. Like, look, what is, look what I have to work with. I know, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> How can this be my son? <laughs> <laughs> that is that is a, a funny movie, that one, Son mm-hmm. of Godzilla. I, 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 I know a lot of people said they, you know, they've seen that one. They've been quite disappointed because, of course, there's no cities that get destroyed in that. Mm-hmm. It's just... You know, it's, it's almost very like different. a kids' movie, almost. <laughs> it, it is. It, it, it sort of is, but um, but even in in the kids' movies, I mean, if you look at the Mothra uh, movies, mm-hmm. which are obviously designed very much for for kids directly, uh, right? There, there's still a bit more of a story to it. Son of Godzilla, just honestly, it was just it was Daddy Day Camp, <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it is. Um, right. It was really, really, yeah, that one was was kind of weird. But, um, uh, the, I mean, it's, oh, look, I, I still love this. I love the cheesiness of the early movies, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, and the other thing, too, is that the suit that is worn by the actor who plays Godzilla in the early ones never quite fits properly. You know, it's always got this bagginess <laughs> and sloppiness to it, you know, which they would lose in later years. But it's still, you know, and he's still got the very short snout. You know, his snout would start to grow a little bit more in some of the later <laughs> ones. So it's, um, oh, I just love it. I, I, I really do love it, I have to admit. I really did enjoy the fight scene. Like, I could actually see myself just every once in a while just cueing the fight scene for shits and giggles. Just, like, if I need a laugh or just need to smile, I can see myself just, like, cueing up the actual fight scene at the end. Because that's cute. It's funny. And it's campy. And, you know, it's, it's, it's great nostalgia. But the overall film, I just can't see myself watching this film again and again and again. It's like, I, I can watch the first, you know, few minutes when they introduce the concept of the island. I really like that. Then I'm going to fast forward to the fight at the end. That's me. So. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Like, I, I, it's, I, I actually found that for me, the story actually did keep me fairly engrossed for where it was it was made. I mean, because we have all this stuff like there's a, a moon base and we have a rocket ship, and you know, so. Um, but is that's the other thing too? The special effects in this, um, I quite liked. I mean, the the Japanese model making for this period of time, I still think is excellent. Mm-hmm. You know, the, yeah. the spaceships and all that sort of stuff. It's yeah, really good. Yeah, the overall good. aesthetic of the film is actually good. But, yeah, this story just did not grab me at all. I don't know. Just for some reason, I was just kind of like just not feeling it. <laughs> well, like, another thing, too, about it is that in all the Godzilla um, movies, there's generally quite a strong female character. Mm-hmm. And, and there really isn't one in this. I mean, there is a, a female lead. But Mm -hmm. she starts off good, then gets turned bad when she gets controlled by the aliens, then turns good again. But she's always sort of in the background, you know. There's there's no real Uh, female female leads at all in this. Right, I agree completely, except for the the female alien race that's trying to take over the world. Oh, true, (laughs) yes, yeah, that is very true. (laughs) Now, yeah, I just, yeah, I really, oh, that was actually kind of funny because it turns turns out that the aliens, if it's really, really, really cold, that they can't stand... Was it the cold? They couldn't stand the cold, so they would turn into slugs? Or was it... They couldn't stand the heat? No, they, they turn... They turn no, no, no. They turn into rocks. They, they like... Oh. Um, <laughs> no, just... I, I think what's... I can just where I saw some, like, slugs. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, what, what, they're meant to be, like, um, living yeah, metal. I've been on a lot of allergy medicine yeah. this week, so, yeah. I know. No, they're... Yeah, I've seen some stuff that wasn't there uh, while I was watching it. So. They're, meant to, they're meant to be a bit like... Uh, liquid metal think about um okay like, okay. like terminator 2 okay, okay so gotcha. so the idea is that if it gets too cold what happens is they turn into like this liquid metal and then turn into like this giant stone yeah sort of thing, <laughs> right and and they and they and they go into hibernation uh, and then when it gets really hot then they can turn into people again uh oh and God. that's and that's why their secret base was under mount fuji because of all oh, the volcanic God. stuff. You see. <laughs> see, when so, you tell the story, it sounds interesting, but when I watch the movie, I'm not nearly as interested. <laughs> I, I think you just have a gift for storytelling, Warren. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I just, I mean, I, 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 I grew up with these movies, you know. like They were always on uh, Australian TV, whether it be on the, the Late Show or maybe if you'd be very lucky on a Sunday afternoon, like a, a cold, wintry Sunday afternoon and, uh, you know, two o'clock or something, you'd be stuck inside as a young kid and then you could not believe your luck. There would be a Godzilla movie on, um, <laughs> you know. So, so I, I mean, I grew up with them. and I mean, I've seen them all and I just absolutely love them. And, and you know, I, I don't care if they're the original cheesy ones or the really hardcore later ones. I, I just, I, I love them all. You know, I really do. Totally. No, I get you. you no, know. I, I enjoyed this one for the fight. Like I said, so if, I think if you're a hardcore Godzilla fan, definitely watch it one time so you've completed, you know, your set. If you're a casual Godzilla watcher, just fast forward to the end, watch the fight. If you don't like Godzilla at all, you're not going to like this movie at all. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, I mean, I, I would always say to people if you've if you've never seen the original Japanese Godzilla franchise um, or the Gamera franchise as well is another one. Um, mm-hmm. if, if you've never seen them, then you are better off to watch the. Um, 
what they call the Millennium franchise, which is mm-hmm. uh, starts from 1999 onwards, because you'll mm-hmm. find them much more similar to the US style movies. Um, okay. The stories are very dark. We've got a lot of character development and all this sort of stuff. If mm-hmm. you really like them, then you probably won't like these early 60s and, you know, right. um, and, and 70s Godzillas because they are very cheesy, you know, in, in comparison. Mm-hmm. But because I, <laughs> because I grew up with them, I've just got a soft spot for them, you know. So I, I'm always going to love them and I always love sitting back, you know, and, and, and watching one of them. But um, so, all right, if you've got to rate this in our mm. normal way that we do on mm-hmm. this show with the great okay. man. How <laughs> how how many Eric Roberts would you would you give this um, out of five? I'm going to give this two point five Eric Roberts. 2. Oh, 5 two point five out of five Eric Roberts. Ooh, so it's so- not it's it's watchable. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of people like this film, and just because it was lost on me doesn't mean it's not a good film. It's definitely watchable. And like I said, and, and even though I'm not going to watch the movie again, I will watch the fight scenes again. So it, it definitely has replay value for me. Not the entire film, but it definitely has replay value. So for that, yeah, definitely two point five out of five. Eric Roberts for me. <laughs> ah, interesting. Well, I'm going to go a little bit higher, but to be truthful, I'm not going to go a lot higher. I'm going to give it three and a half. Three and a half mm-hmm. Eric's. Um, mm-hmm. uh, three and a half of the great man himself, because it's <laughs> simply because, you know, I, I, I grew up with all these movies, and I, I agree with you that the story is a bit basic in this. You know, they seem to spend more time flying around in the spaceship. There's very little character development at all, mm-hmm, if there's mm-hmm. any. Um, exactly. We, we, we appear to have a relationship at one stage between the commander of the moon bay. Oh, sorry, the commander of the spaceship and <laughs> and one of the scientists that works at Monsterland. But it's never developed. We really don't know what's going on there. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm going to say three and a half. Three and okay. a half Eric's. That's still quite um, watchable. That's still watchable. Oh, yeah, yeah, for me. Um, but it, it's, yeah, look, it, it's, uh, the thing about it was it was meant to be, as we said, you know, this big blockbuster, you know, 11 monsters. Uh, and, you know, I mean, until Godzilla Final Wars, you are not going to see as many monsters in one film as you do in this. It's really the only times that it happens. Um, and the other thing, too, about this is that they're all fighting in one battle. It's not like we've got a battle yeah. between two monsters, then another battle between two monsters, then another battle between two different monsters. This is an 11-way fight. Um, yeah. And- it's really unfair. It's like it's like nine on one. Well, it does actually, <laughs> although, mind you, it does actually take all 10 of them to bring down King Ghidorah. <laughs> um, you know, that's like, that's, that's not fair. Although, in that sense, maybe not actually all 10, only nine or only eight, actually, because Son of Godzilla yeah, basically Rodan's, just. Rodan's, Rodan's pussy ass flew off at the beginning of the fight. He and just, he he just flies around. His ass and came back. I know, he, he just basically just flies around and, and, and just watches. He doesn't actually do anything. Do you, and, think, they, do you think they kicked Rodan's uh, ass off camera once the movie ended? They're just like, you motherfucker we needed your help where'd you go and he, like, and he was just like oh i thought you guys had this i didn't know you needed my help you knew motherfucker you knew <laughs> so, like they're all beating his ass off <laughs> oh, <laughs> See, it's... stuff that happens on the godzilla <laughs> movie sphere that doesn't get filmed <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe the actor who played rodan didn't get along with the actor that played godzilla i don't know um it's <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, because that's the thing that, you know, a lot of us often forget is that there is a person inside each monster. I you do know? actually forget that. That sounds goofy, but I totally get what you're saying because I do actually forget that too. Because it's, you know, especially now with so much CGI and stuff, it's like, yeah, these are actual suits. These are not yes. mechanized suits. These are people in suits having to do this shit. So, yeah. And, and that's the thing, you know, even today uh, in modern Godzilla, uh, we forget there is still a man inside the suit. And in, in the Japanese franchise. Yes, in, yeah. And, American franchise would always be computer generated. Oh, that's of course. What we do, but, yeah, yeah in, in the, I think that's cool that Japan still does the tradition of man in the suit. We'll use CGI, but there's still going to be a dude in the suit. Well, I know. Off. Well, that's why, that's why I just, and, you know, no offense, American. I love you to death, but stop making Godzilla movies, please. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, it's... I am excited to see our next one. I have to admit. Oh, like, last no. Got, the last one got the Hollywood treatment. Of course it did because it was made in the United States, but it still has. And I will go on record and say this again. It still has my favorite Godzilla kill in it of all time. My favorite Godzilla kill of all time is in the American version and oh. not the Japanese version. <laughs> How intense is that? But, <laughs> oh, look, I, look, it's, I don't know. When, when I watched the second God, American Godzilla, I... I have to admit, I actually quite enjoyed the movie. Uh, I'll be honest. Yeah, I, like I, I yeah, actually I like quite it. enjoyed it. It wasn't perfect, but it, it's good. I liked it a but lot. But I, I just, I, I just think that sometimes, I don't know how to say this, and I don't want to sound offensive to anybody listening, but America, your culture is huge. It's massive. <laughs> you don't need to keep stealing stuff from other people. <laughs> You know what I mean? I feel, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I know what you, you mean. know, I'm not offended. No, not I, offended. Uh, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah, it, it's like American culture is huge. It's so mm-hmm. big. It's massive. You know, just leave it to the Japanese. They do it so much better. You know, it, it's. But anyway, um, I know I'll, I'll get hate tweets over that, won't I? No, nah, I think you'll be okay. <laughs> I think I think you'll be okay. As, hey, as long as I'm like you know on your side, I think you're okay. <laughs> oh, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. All right. Well, um, I reckon we should take a, a quick break and uh, be right back with a brand new segment. This is going to be a long edit. Oh, no, that's staying in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the only Funny to Us podcast with brand new episodes every Monday night at 8 at OnlyFunnyToUs.com. And we're back. Now, before we get on to movie number two, we're going to start a brand new segment here, aren't we, Velvet? Yes, this is cool. And, I'm really excited about this. And it is called... Send us your short film. <laughs> I've got to come up with a better intro than that. Um, <laughs> I'll do better next week, guys. I'll do better next week. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yes. I don't know why it was funny, but it was. So, <laughs> so yes, send us your short film. And um, we've got one. Uh, we've actually had one sent into us. Uh, so, um, I... I watched this and I really enjoyed it. So, Velvet, tell us a bit about it. Okay, cool. So I just want to say thank you to those of you that tweet us and DM us and email us your uh, movie requests. And that's how I actually found this short is the makers of this short actually tweeted us, hey, check out our short. And I did. And I was like, wow, this is really good. So spoiler alert, it's a good short. So this is actually a horror short and it's international. So it's called Bestemming Bereicht, but they were kind enough to give us English subtitles for this. This is a Dutch Short horror, yeah, short film horror, horror film. <laughs> I don't know. I can't say yeah, uh, yeah, words yeah. together. A short, a short, <laughs> a, short um, a short Dutch horror film. <laughs> so you can't say it either. No, I no, can't. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't know why. No, it's, uh, <laughs> all joking, all joking aside. So this was actually it's called Bestemming Bereikt or Destination Reached. Um, it is in Dutch. It was made in Holland, and this was actually crowdfunded, which is pretty awesome. They set up a little Cinecrowd uh, fundraiser online to make this short, and all they asked for was a donation of 1,000 euros, and they got 1,000 euros, and they got 41 supporters. So 41 people helped to make this film with their donations. It's a a 16-minute short. And although it's so short, it tells a lot of story. It builds a lot of suspense. And it has a really unusual twist at the end that just kind of makes you go, I'm not sure if I understood what happened. So it's something you can definitely rewatch and you can discuss with your friends. So if you want to check out Destination Reached, you can actually go to YouTube. They created their own channel. And you can watch it there. All you do is type in the search bar, short film horror, destination reached. Well, also, if you follow us on our social media, I will tweet occasionally so you can find this and go watch it. I can't tell you too much about the story because it's a 16-minute short. And if I reveal too much, yeah, I know. you're going to know too much of the story. So, But I can just say this much. It starts off with a police officer responding to you know, a message on the police radio. 
And he ends up at an abandoned movie theater to check out a disturbance. And what happens there will change his life and possibly yours forever. So, yeah, no, great story. And what did you think about this short? I loved it. To be, you know, honest, I mean, there, there are a lot of short films which sometimes are just so pretentious. You know, they've, they've got to pat so much stuff into such a short amount of time. Um, and it's also quite often they're sometimes made by people who think that their abilities are much greater than they actually are. But in this case, this is not not true at all. This is really well done. It's really well thought out. Um, it's really well shot. The story is absolutely in- – it's fascinating, um, the story. And it will – the one thing that – the movie is 16 minutes long, if I'm not cre- – I'm correct, I think, 16 minutes. Yes, that's and, correct. Um, yes. It, it's – you will spend not 16 minutes talking about this film after you've watched it. You will probably spend three hours, 16 minutes talking about this film. Mm-hmm, because yes. I guarantee you, if you watch this with a group of people – Every single person will have a different idea about what this movie or how this movie ends. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, uh, there's a couple things that really impressed me about this. First off, for a thousand euros, I thought the production value on this was much higher. They really put these resources to good use. It's a high quality short film. Never at one point was I like, oh, that looks cheap. Oh, that looks fake. Like you never, you never get distracted by the budget of this short also for how short it is it does a really good job of building and holding suspense and there's even some there's even some jump scares i'm like how in the world do you have time to have jump scares in a 16 minute story and they pulled it off so this is definitely worth checking out so if you're the kind of person you're like oh i don't have time to watch all these movies all the time you can take you know 16 minutes for yourself you know make yourself a cup of tea you know or a cup of coffee grab an energy drink, whatever, just sit down for 16 minutes and watch this and your brain will be entertained for hours because you will be rethinking the story and like, well, what did this mean? And well, is this what happened? And what about that? Like definitely worth checking out. So Bestemming Bereicht or Destination Reached, a short film by Ivar Tillema or Ivar Tillema. And yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I, I, look, I, I, I recommend everyone, you know, um, uh, search this out. Um, subscribe, you can subscribe to them, obviously, on YouTube, um, as you said. Uh, but mm-hmm. even if you don't subscribe, watch it. Um, it's, you'll enjoy it. If you're, if you're a fan of, um, horror suspense, especially suspense, then I, I think you'll like it. There, I, I can see lots of different things in this movie. Like, I know when I was watching it, um, recollections of the ring and things like that came into my mind. Um, there's a little thing that happens in this movie. Uh, where um, uh, when the police officer is in the cinema and then mm-hmm. suddenly a uh, a movie just starts to play for no mm-hmm. apparent reason. And the yes. little movie yet, which is played within the movie, in itself is really spooky, actually. Yes. It's really yeah. spooky. Yeah, um, that was... That was impressive. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, I, I really, really liked it. Um, and uh, although I think we should actually say because I know we keep saying that this is Dutch. Um, mm-hmm. It because of course I know everyone gets this wrong when they say oh it's Holland. It is of course the Netherlands. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yes. Because Holland is yes. part of the Netherlands. It's not the actual right. whole country. But um, I, I really I only say that because I know we've got some listeners uh, over there and I don't want to offend them. Uh, but it's um, it, it's a great little movie and I really loved it. It did keep me like on the edge of my seat, watching it all the way through. And uh, Mm -hmm. some, yeah, like you said, some spooky moments. And uh, Mm -hmm. no, definitely check it out. It's it's great. And disclaimer, I'm sure we've mentioned that, but just one more time, this is in Dutch language. It is subtitled in English. Please don't let the language barrier put you off watching this. Take the 16 minutes to read the subtitles. There's not that many. And it's really more of a visual experience than it is a language barrier. So, yeah, definitely give it a try. You know, I think I think more people need foreign cinema in their lives. Oh, <laughs> I a, agree. Yeah. Yeah. So well, definitely check this one out. Well, when we say foreign cinema, we're, we're referring to non-English For- speaking. No, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, um, but, uh, but the other thing, though, is the dialogue in this movie. There's not a lot of it. So <laughs> e- even if you're not big into reading subtitles when you're, 
Um, you know, what is it? We had someone on the other the other week who said they preferred to watch their movies than to read their movies. Right. Um, but that it, was it, Count Kenny. Oh, yeah. he's epic. He, he loves. He loves. He's like dub everything. He's like. Uh, he watches a lot of, he loves Asian cinema, you know, like uh, samurai, you know, kung fu fighting, any kind of fighting <laughs> film. He's like, dub it all. He's like, I don't want to read. <laughs> it's <laughs> all, but, but, but I, know, I think that's a shame, but that's a shame. I know. <laughs> but it's, uh, but there's, there's, uh, of the 16 minutes, there's probably only about five minutes of dialogue. Right. The rest is is all suspense. It's pure suspense. Uh, so, yeah, d- definitely don't, you know, let, any of that sort of, you know, uh, put you off. It's, um, th- there was, uh, but, but the other thing though, I have to, to say, we're not going to give away the ending. We don't even want to tell you too much more about what happens because it's such a short mm-hmm. movie. But the one mm-hmm. thing is that after we watched this, Velvet and I came up with two, and we won't say what it is, but we came up with two totally different interpretations of this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, they, I mean, your, idea was a hundred percent different to what my yes. idea was and yes. that was interesting with itself that we got something very mm-hmm. different out of the one story mm-hmm. you know um and and i think that's uh, that's fantastic because yeah, means, i like you know, the poetry interpretation how people can interpret art or poetry in totally different ways we all receive a different message and you said it reminded you of back in school when mm-hmm. you had to Interpret uh, oh, Animal yes. Farm. Animal Farm. <laughs> I, I can I can still remember um, we had to read Animal Farm when I was at school. You know, sort of forced reading, and uh, mm-hmm. and and of course, Animal Farm comes with a um, a secondary book which actually lists you know who all the characters are, um, mm-hmm. who, who they're meant to be in real life, um, the different farms. It, it's meant to tell you you know what countries they're meant to be, and you know and right. all that sort of stuff. And, right. and I can still remember, and, and so we had to have these, you know, discussions ad nauseum, you know, about mm-hmm. about Animal Farm. And I can still remember one kid just stood up and sort of said, Sir, sir, did you ever think that he just woke up one morning and said, I'd write a fun book about animals? <laughs> <laughs> he actually said that? Yeah. Good for him. Good for him. Yeah. For him. Uh, I'm still friends with that guy, actually. So... Um, <laughs> as- <laughs> Somebody you stay friends with for life. You yeah, forward-thinking people I, who go against the status quo. I, I Good for him. I know. I won't. I won't. I won't name him on me on air. But uh, uh, it was. Yeah, it, it, it's. Um, uh, it was. Yeah, one of those classic moments from school. Yes, Inus Dontus Noas. Ah, don't worry. There's somebody listening who will get what that joke means. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, the, the joys of growing up in a uh, in a private school. Um, anyway, uh, the um, yeah, definitely check this out. It's it's a great little short film. So uh, yeah, definitely. So Bestemming Bereich, the short film by Eva Tillema, and uh, follow us on our social media. We'll plug that at the end of the show. That way, you can find the link to this and watch it. Excellent. All right. Uh, quick break because someone's decided to cut their lawn at the moment. I don't know if you can hear a lawnmower going in the background. Um, so, um, I don't hear it. <laughs> that's all right. I don't so, hear it. <laughs> we'll just take a quick break and we'll be right back. I worked in the garden center and a lady came in and we had the flowers and they were in the plants and she asked me how much the chlamydia's were. <laughs> the Only Funny Does podcast available now at onlyfunnydoes.com. Now we're back with movie number 2. Well, I suppose it's actually movie number 3, but we'll call it movie number 2 because it's <laughs> the send what is it send us your short film. Uh, isn't really quite, yeah, part of it. Anyway, I, I promise, I'll, I promise, I'll think of a better intro. Don't worry, I've got a week to think about it. You know, so uh, we can try. The, we can call it the mini movie review. The mini movie review. Oh, I like that. That's pretty cool. There, there yeah, we go. I like that. I like that. Now, our second movie of the podcast. Now, I've been looking forward to talking about this because this is a fun movie. This is a fun movie, and it is Shark to Puss. From 2010. How can you not like this? Sharktopus. Half shark. Half octopus. Um, 
I absolutely love this, and there is another very special reason why I love this movie so much. It stars (laughs) the man himself. Yes, the king of B-grade, Eric Roberts. So, oh, yes. So we we just had to, to, you know, to talk about, um, to talk about this one. So, all right, very quick rundown, and then we'll start. (laughs) <laughs> to dissect it <laughs> as only a sharktopus would. Now, um, from 2010, of course, as we said, it's a Roger Corman uh, production. And um, uh, there's an interesting thing about that too, which we'll bring up a little bit later. But um, mm-hmm. now it's basically uh, about a, um, uh, a business called Blue Water, which is sort of a, a scientific biological company working for the US military trying to create some weird creature uh, which will be able to hunt down terrorists and drug smugglers and you know and so forth so it's you know it's that old story you know like those old ridiculous ludicrous stories we used to hear you know about Americans trying to drop alligators into North Vietnam and all this sort of crap but of course the movie plays on this idea of um, trying to create this hybrid creature which it can use as a weapon but it all goes horribly wrong because the sharktopus half shark half octopus escapes and of course starts killing everybody and hunting everybody down who is anywhere close to water uh, or is on the water and uh, then of course starts moving itself down into Mexico uh, where of course Blue Water has to put together a team to try to hunt down the sharktopus and try to recapture it uh, before for it does, you know, too much damage and the US government gets all embarrassed because, of course, they have created this creature. Um, I really, really like this, Velvet. What, <laughs> I'm scared to ask you what you thought, but um, <laughs> what were your thoughts? This movie was a lot of fun. <laughs> I had a lot of so fun. So much fun. fun. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like this movie because it knew it what it was. It did not take itself serious. The acting is bad. The dialogue is bad. It just kills for no reason. It just it's it's the acting is really bad, but in a laughable way. It's just it, it's just a B movie in every sense. Totally fun. Totally entertaining. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> well, I mean, apart from Eric Roberts, there's no one in this film you'll probably recognize. Except for Roger Corman has a cameo. That's exactly right, <laughs> which I was, I was, I was going to bring up. But, um, yes, so he does actually appear as a cameo in this, uh, in this film himself. The, um, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the CGI is what you would expect from a sci-fi, as in the company sci-fi uh, production, which of course is is what it is. Um, and mm-hmm. it's also the first movie in a franchise because um, just like um, uh, Sharknado, uh, Sharktopus mm-hmm. has been franchised, and there are of course three Sharktopus movies now. Uh, this was mm-hmm. just the uh, uh, just the first, but. Oh, it, it is it is lots of fun. And the other thing, too, that I found amazing about it, there is a huge perv factor in this movie because <laughs> there, are, there are our two female leads, if you like, who is the daughter um, of Eric Roberts, uh, mm-hmm. one of the biologists, and then we also have a female reporter who is trying mm-hmm. to follow the story of the sharktopus on, on the loose. But with the exception of those two, every single woman in this movie is only dressed in a bikini. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know? <laughs> that's true. Everybody is in a bikini. <laughs> um, e- even the, I suppose, the second largest female role, you know, or third largest, I should say, in this movie is the um, the assistant to the radio DJ. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, even she, when she's in the studio, is still dressed in a bikini. Bikini, yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. And that's very noticeable. You cannot not notice that. It's like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, no, she was she was a very attractive um, uh, actress. Um, and uh, but it's look, it, it's there's it a lot of death and destruction. Um, you mm-hmm. know, I should say in this, the shark divorce does pretty much. Kill. It's not a pretty high death count. We would have to say, wouldn't mm-hmm. we? Uh, and uh, oh, totally. And it's it's it, it 
uses its tentacles, it uses its mouth, it's, uh, it uses everything to just kill everything and destroy everything. Boats. <laughs> uh, I mean, it even eats a car in one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it, you know, uh, in one the scene. I pacing on this movie because, like, um, I, I, I went into this somehow. I never saw anything from this franchise. I actually didn't really know anything about it. And I prefer to go into movies not knowing too much. That way, you know, you get surprised and you get that, you know, initial fresh reaction. Action. And I was surprised how quickly you get to see the shark the puss. I thought they would like build up to it and it'd be kind of a slow burn, but no, within the first five minutes of the film, you full on see the shark the puss and they're ex- explaining what the shark the puss is and how it came about and, <laughs> and why. Oh, it absolutely. And, yeah, I mean, they don't waste any time showing the shark the puss and they don't even call it the shark the puss for a long time in the movie. They actually call it by its government name of S. Uh, 11. Yes, S11. S11. That's right. <laughs> um, I don't, why S11? Does it mean that there were 10 other shark or That's what I was wondering. I, that might be. That's what I think it might be. This t- 10 failed attempts, and this was the first one where, like, okay, we've got it under control. We've got the hybridization down. It's a killing machine that we control. <laughs> until you know some software gets damaged and then oops <laughs> now we got to go catch it and kill it <laughs> but there's lots of com- <laughs> there's lots of comedy in this one this is yeah. um this is like a i mean some of the sci-fi movies you know they can some of them could be deadly serious and others can be almost you know black humor dark humor um i mm-hmm. mean shark to uh, sorry um sharknado is a classic example or lava lanchula another it's ex- example <laughs> where um you know they they're not really meant to be taken to seriously where you know some other ones you know dino croc and uh, if you just go on and name so many other films but they are meant to be taken very seriously but this one sends itself up all the way through the movie. Um, oh, this movie knows it's funny. Like, yeah. they have so much fun with this, and then you have fun because you realize you're not supposed to take it serious either. You're just supposed to sit back and enjoy. <laughs> well, I love the way that the radio DJ is talking to his assistant, and, and she's quite convinced that the Chartopus is real. Of course, he thinks it's all a load of nonsense. And he keeps on saying, oh, that stuff only happens in movies and, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and all this sort of stuff. And, um, and so it's continually making fun of the fact that they're actually making a B-grade monster flick. Uh, you know, so and all, all the way through. And there's also some great lines. I mean, one of my favourite lines in this is where the reporter, um, they track down this um, old seafairy sort of captain of a fishing boat and uh, who, you know, says he knows, he's seen the sharktopus and he knows where it will sort of uh, appear next. And so they team, right. up, they team up with him. But uh, when he, um, you know, offers to take them down to, I think it's Mexico, and he says, and she goes, oh, this is so wonderful. I could give you a hug. Well, if you were a little bit more attractive and had slightly better personal hygiene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of jabs in the movie like this. Um, I also really like, actually do like the CGI in this. It's 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 totally, like I said, this movie knows what it is. It's not like, oh, it's a shame we don't have a better budget for better CGI. No, they didn't give a fuck. But they, but the shark post actually looks pretty cool. That's a pretty fearsome-looking creature. Oh, it's um, a nasty creature, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they even gave, like, the shark part of it, like, extra spikes. So it was like, oh, on the sides of its face had all those yes. spikes coming out. And I'm like, oh, that's really a scary-looking shark, dude. And then it's even scarier because it's got eight tentacles. And the tentacles are not only just tentacles. They have, like, little spikes beaters on the ends of the tentacles that it uses to puncture and kill with. That was pretty intense. Oh, I like, know. And, and, and unlike a, a real octopus, this thing can actually stand up on its tentacles and oh, walk yes. on land. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't actually know how it breathes through its, because it's still got gills. <laughs> Right, so I'm not too sure how it actually breathes, but I don't think it does. I, think um, I don't think it does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, it seems to have no problems, sort of like uh, wandering around the tourist resorts. And I have to admit, how many Mexican tourist resorts? I'm assuming they were. I don't actually know if it was filmed in Mexico, or uh, I've got a feeling it was though. But um, were um, uh, I was going to say. <laughs> How much assistance or stock footage do you reckon that they took from the Mexican Tourist Bureau? 
because <laughs> there's so much stock footage in this, you know, like of all the, um, you know, of all the rides and the bungee jumping. And, and it's a little bit like, it's almost like to me, the Mexican government sort of said, oh, yeah, we'll, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, we'll give you this. Yeah, you do this, sure, you know. We'll out. Yeah, just give us a credit in the film at the end. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the kills in this movie are crazy. Like some of them are really like outrageous and they're just like and it's funny because a lot of times you see them coming but still when they happen it's still really gratifying you're just like oh watch they're going to eat that lady aren't they and then that person gets eaten and you're like oh see told you <laughs> but you're not I like know. you're not like bored you're like entertained by it oh it's it's um <laughs> i i know it's uh i mean what i was just gonna say yeah the kills are really kind of cool i mean there's we've got uh not only people being you know torn in half, people being eaten. Um, we've got decapitations. We've got mm-hmm. um, we, we've got this thing <laughs> impaling people. I mean, it's it's mm-hmm. almost like it uses its legs almost to create human sish. Uh, what are they? Shishka bobs. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, it's uh, it, it's actually pretty cool. And when it's under the water, when you just see it as a shadow, it actually looks pretty good. The CGI is pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, but we'll warn people it's, um, the CGI, it's typically sci-fi, you know? So, mm-hmm. um, if, if you're not, don't watch a lot of these movies, but you've seen Sharknado, then you'll have an idea of what the CGI level is sort of at. Right. I mean, it's obviously, it's obviously fake looking. So hopefully there's no such thing as a shark post, hopefully. But, um, yeah, even, I mean, it doesn't look real, but at the same time, it's still real fun to watch so don't let that discourage you don't be like yeah so i was reading a little piece of trivia here it says that in what is it jamaica there's actually or caribbean excuse me in the caribbean there's actually a half shark half octopus monster known as the luska so this is actually in a caribbean legend (laughs) oh oh, i was was about i was about to say hang on you did study science when you were at school, Velvet. <laughs> no, okay, so no, it's a legend. It's a, yeah, okay. It's a Caribbean legend. That right. Doesn't, we, don't, we don't, there's no scientific proof that the Luska, also known as the Shocktopus in the Caribbean, exists, but it's kind of like the Loch Ness Monster of uh, the Caribbean. <laughs> ah, so is this is it meant to be as big as our our monster in this movie? Or I don't know. I would have to look it up. It's just a little piece of trivia I found. But they, that's common in a lot of cultures. There's a lot of like we're laughing because the sci-fi and all these B movies have gone off on this you know half this half that monster genre. But in a lot of uh, cultures in the world, there's stuff like where Crocodiles. There's all kinds of weird shit like that. Where there's like Werewolf every crocodiles. culture has different. Were yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, I'm serious. Oh I'm serious. wow, wow. And, yeah, every culture has like these weird hybrid monster creatures in their legends. So it's actually you know to us it's funny and it's a novelty. But the, in a lot of cultures, if you look at their legends, they have these hybrid creatures that you're supposed to be afraid of. See, I don't think that's really interesting. I don't think like in Australia, I don't think there are any such mythical creatures. Um, the only mythical creature that we all get, you know, told about as children from day one is the bunyip. Um, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't sound very scary. It sounds all cute and cuddly. Um, uh, but the bunyip is actually meant to be this very, very dangerous creature that lives by, uh, billabongs. Um, and you won't know what a billabong is. None of our, <laughs> uh, it, it's like a, a billabong is like a, uh, a body of water, which has been cut off from a river. Okay. Okay. And uh, and they, they sort of live there, and when young children get too close, the bill, you know, the bunny will take them. Uh, so, oh, my God. Uh, so, but if you think about it, it makes great cultural sense, because, of course, it's adults telling their kids, don't go too close to the water, you mm-hmm. know? So, it, um, you know, so it, it's, uh, uh, so they're using a mythical creature to, you know, to, you know, so the kids don't drown, basically. Right, is, is what, right, totally. Well, but, I mean, that might be why they do that in the Caribbean, too. The, they're like, oh, if you get too close to the water, the shark to puss will get you, or they call it the Luska. So. Yes, <laughs> the Luska, <laughs> the Luska. But, but Those you, sound a little more dignified than shark to puss. Well, I mean, it's like um, <laughs> if, uh, if we've got the Luska and, you know, we talk about the uh, – I mean, there's obviously so many of these creatures, you know, obviously uh, Britain has – you know, supposedly Nessie, the Loch Ness monster. Um, mm-hmm. You've got um, uh, Europe, uh, especially Eastern Europe, is full of so many. You know, various. Mm-hmm. You know, like the 
you know, the, well, what we now call a werewolf, but I don't think they actually use that term in Eastern Europe, mm-hmm. but, but that whole concept. Um, United States, because you've got the Yeti, isn't that your big creature or? Yeah, we've got the Yeti, exactly. We've also got the Bunny Man. We've also got the Goat Man. The Bunny Man? <laughs> we've got a lot of. Well, is, yeah, but that's lot that's of just not. Is, is that like. Is that like the Easter Bunny's evil twin? It's actually supposed to be a man wearing a bunny suit that's a serial killer, but. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's, but, but I've. But I've heard two versions of it. There's actually supposed to be like this giant humanoid bunny rabbit that goes around <laughs> killing people. <laughs> so I've heard two versions of it. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh. And the goat man's kind of like uh, you know, like a evil version of the god Pan. It's just you know, you know, he's got a goat head and he's got goat legs, but he's got like a human torso and arms, and he'll attack cars with a hatchet. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. So, but are these are these meant to be real stories or are these just they're supposed urban to be legends? actual sightings people went to the police saying i got attacked and there were numerous sightings a lot of this stuff happened in like the 50s and the 60s and there's actual police reports wow yeah, yeah i swear to god there was something something was going on and wow. there's also the Mothman. I'm sure you may, may have heard of the Mothman. Oh, the Mothman. Well, the, because of the movie, that's, of course, yeah. what made that story um, so famous. Otherwise, I don't think anyone around the world would have ever have heard of it um, if it hadn't <laughs> been for the, you know, uh, for the movie. Uh, but it, it, um, it, do you think many of these – I know we're getting off track a little bit. We'll get back to the movie in a sec. But <laughs> I love cryptozoology. <laughs> there's the Jersey Devil. There's the Jersey Devil, which is a little bit of everything. <laughs> Do you reckon that many of these things are actually based on fact, on reality? I mean, I'm not saying that there really is a Yeti, all right, but that that, that there is some other animal out there which has continually been misidentified or some such thing. Oh, it could definitely be misidentification of creatures. I mean, that definitely happens. When you see something and you don't know what it is for the very first time, like, you know, like, you know, I love the platypus, but look look at the history of the platypus. The first time somebody from Western culture saw you know, heard of a platypus, they thought it was a hoax. They were like, yes, oh, that can't be right. real. Like, the guy submitted, like, oh, wow, look at this weird little animal that lives in Australia. And people were like, stop it. That's a fucking beaver with the duck bill. Quit yep, it. And he's right. like, no, it's real. <laughs> the Royal Society, when they first took back specimens, didn't believe that it was a real animal. I know. Um, but it's interesting, though, that, for instance, the bunyip in Australia, there's a lot of people who are now... Um, starting to believe that the bunyip is real in Australia, hmm. but oh, wow. uh, but I, I need to take it to the next point. But it's not a bunyip. <laughs> um, but what it's often believed is what it possibly is is sharks. Oh, because what we now know, what we've learned, is that sharks, even saltwater sharks, can live in freshwater. We now believe up to about ninety days. In fresh water, and so mm-hmm. what? What they're actually doing is that they've been swimming up through these rivers, and if you get a big enough shark, which is managing to get up um, into these rivers, and it has been taking people at the river's edge, and that's where the stories have started, and that's oh. where the bunyip story has possibly started, um, and uh, and so yeah, and and so there's there's a lot of scientists, and that's just the Australian example. I'm sure that there are stories all around the world. Oh you know, my that, god! That a lot of these creatures are real, but they're misidentified. They're actually like um, and a lot of time that might be all it is. It's just you don't know what the fuck you're looking at the first time you see it, but you know you're scared and your brain can't process it. Because I mean, I can't think of a good example, but I know I've definitely seen stuff, and I don't mean like monsters, but like literally like a random object. So, you know how sometimes you look at a picture and you, you just can't make out what the fuck the picture is and yeah. you can just feel your brain trying to process it. And then finally, like when you finally look at it from the right angle or you get close enough, then you're like, oh, OK, OK, I see what that is now. And that might be just what it is. If you're seeing something that you haven't seen for, you know, before or you're seeing it from the wrong angle, even your brain just goes, what the fuck is that? Well, yeah, it's, it's like people, people look at, you know, people look at cloud shapes. And you can have mm-hmm. two people look at exactly the same cloud and see two totally different things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, it's like, like shadow people, you know, it's like, Ew. you know, it's oh, like, um, it, it's like, I mean, 99% of that is just people seeing things out of the corner of their eye and their brain is just uh-huh. misinterpreting what they're seeing, you know. Um, it's, 
But anyway, we shouldn't be going. We're not doing the paranormal show. <laughs> we're doing the cult movie show. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, it's- oh, I just had. <laughs> say really quick i fucking uh, googled bunyip really quick oh my god that thing looks terrifying i hope it's not real mm, no yucky. it's not real no it's it's not real but but the thing is you have to remember though that um uh, a bit like native american culture in mm-hmm. aboriginal culture the uh, the religion of of aboriginal australia is referred to as dream time so that's the actual of religion that's what it's called mm-hmm. and but okay but the thing is that um it's very much it, like it's it's it works with ancestors and with uh, animals and with the environment, so it's all interlinked. So the the thing is that if you've got the story of of the bunyip, it's more than just a creature or a mythical creature; it's also part of the religion. Mm. So it's 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 a really complicated issue, you know. Um, and of course, I'm you know white Australian. I'm not Aboriginal Australian, so obviously, Dreamtime, I know a little bit about probably not as much as i should uh mm-hmm. but it's um but yeah so anyway <laughs> <laughs> oh i forgot to tell you about the jackalope <laughs> the jackalope what's the jackalope that's a, oh that's a rabbit with horns and it only mates during thunderstorms and the way you catch it is you have to put out a little cup of whiskey and it'll drink the whiskey and pass out and then you can cook it and it tastes like lobster a rabbit yep. that tastes like lobster. Yep, and and uh, it talks too. I forgot about that part. It talks too because uh, it'll throw its voice to try to trick you. Because when you're ah. hunting it, yeah, when you're hunting it, so it'll the rabbit do stuff speaks like, English. Over there, it goes over there. There he goes. Go get him. <laughs> so the rabbit yeah. speaks English. Yeah, exactly. And it has horns. And right. it's, uh, called yeah, it's called a jackalope. <laughs> and, and what what country is this one from? <laughs> this is in the United States. This is in the United States. So <laughs> yes. um, I, I just find it interesting that it, it's it's changed its language over the years. Because obviously it would have originally have spoken what Mohican or something or other, and you know, so now it's changed its language to English. You know, well, it, um, it sounds like it's a it's a very adaptable little creature. Well, so. <laughs> it always reminds me of that great sh- great show. In, um, uh, you know, all those ghost hunter shows, you know, that we have, they're all over the world, you know, where they send a team <laughs> in to hunt down ghosts and they never ever find a single bloody thing, you know what I mean? They build up <laughs> yeah. all the suspense and nothing ever happens. And I still remember once that there was one of them where they went to hunt down Hitler's ghost. And oh my God. <laughs> so anyway, they're, um, uh, they're up in the, you know, in the Alps. Uh, what is it? You know, Birch's Garden and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and anyway, so they're calling out for Hitler. Are you here? Are you here? But they're speaking <laughs> to him in English. Oh, now, as far God. as I'm aware, Adolf Hitler spoke German. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know if he... He was too fluent in uh, a lot of other languages. Oh. I, you know, I just don't really study up on the dude. No, it's, <laughs> he it's... had his time in the sun and he's gone and you know what? I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I still remember there was a great meme that went around the internet at the time where it's, you know, hunts down German ghosts. Try to speak to them in English. Yeah, because uh, yeah. yeah, that works every time. <laughs> oh, 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 God. Anyway, now, I, I, I'm i trying to remember now. Were we talking about a movie called Shark to Puss? <laughs> oh, and that, well, I mean, that led to all these awesome you know, animal hybrids and uh, cryptozoology and... <laughs> You know, we had to end on the jackalope because. You know, oh my goodness! My no. favorite. Oh, and there's also a German version of the jackalope, and I love the name. It's a it's a Wolpertinger. Oh, <laughs> that sounds cool. Yeah, I love it in English because we call it a Wolpertinger, and it always makes me laugh. I'm like, yeah, it's a Wolpertinger. Wolf- oh, like, what's wow. that? Oh, it's a rat. But it's, it's, horns, is, is, it just, is it just <laughs> is it just me, or do things always sound scarier in German? Absolutely, definitely. It is a very crisp harsh sounding language they just have a really you know just a lot of their vowels are very short and quick it's and all they have yeah. a lot of and they have a lot of guttural you know uh, uh consonants that sound like basically like you're clearing your throat <laughs> that's not an exaggeration yeah. you're, literally, you're literally clearing your throat to pronounce an r or to pronounce you know some of the consonants so yeah it's a it's a very guttural you know crisp language and what, it's quick i, I so, remember i remember in a, uh, in australia a few years ago there was a show that used to be on um a radio network here um uh, called Sin Radio, um, S Y N, not S I N, mm-hmm. uh, which was um, uh, which was uh, sh- uh, it's the Student Youth Network. You have to be between, I think it's 
I think it's 12 and 25 uh, to be on the air, uh, and you must be an actual student uh, at the mm-hmm. time. So university students, secondary school students, and so forth. And they get their own radio shows. Uh, it's a great idea. It's all publicly funded. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. And, uh, and some of the shows these kids come up with are, are brilliant. And there was one which was called The Doctor Who Hour, and it used to run uh-huh. like once a week. And they were talking about Doctor Who. And they had a competition online to find the scariest Doctor Who villain of all time. All right? Uh Uh-huh. But what they found was the Daleks won, okay? Yeah, I had a feeling you were going to say that. But it wasn't wasn't the actual Daleks. It was the German Daleks. Oh, how funny. Right? Because if if you can remember, if if anyone who watches modern-day Doctor Who, there is the – when Davros comes back and he steals the Earth and then he tries to destroy every known life uh, in the universe other than the Daleks – and when the Daleks are in London and stuff, they're just going around, you know, at Starmanate, at Starmanate. <laughs> but, but it crosses when Martha Jones. But in German, exterminieren, in Ge- yeah. exterminieren, yeah. exterminieren. Yeah. And, and everyone said they were so much scarier, you know, when they were speaking in German. Uh, yeah, that makes sense, totally. Well, which is interesting too, because Davros is meant to almost be. Um, like Davros, in a sense, is modelled off Nazism, you know. So mm-hmm. you know that whole uh, that whole society, uh, you know, that he he came from, um, you know, that created the Daleks. They're all based, you know, on Nazis and stuff like that. So yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Anyway, God, we have got so far off topic. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I know. We, <laughs> That's I, the beauty of this show. <laughs> We're here to have fun. This I is know. not, you know, this is not. <laughs> this so, is not serious. We're here to have fun, <laughs> have a good time. We're here to entertain you. And hopefully save you some time, because every once in a while we review a piece of shit, and we'll tell you, don't watch that movie. But yeah. if you want to have fun, we'll tell you which movies to go watch. But so, this is yeah. this is definitely one I say to people, watch. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's it will appear on the Sci-Fi Channel from time to time. You know, it will just pop up. Um, if not, it's readily available. You know, to uh, to buy. Uh, so it's it's really worth it because it's a real fun one. Of all these creature features out there, it's one of the most fun I've yet seen. I reckon. Um, and also, also great perv. You know, factor in this because every woman. <laughs> And I'm, I am not joking when I say this. Every single person in this movie, other than two, are in bikinis. And, yeah. e- and even for the girls out there, when the our main star, you know, goes after the sharktopus in the final scene, guess what? He takes his shirt off because you can't fight a sharktopus if you're wearing a shirt. I was just getting ready to say that. Yeah, I was like, well, even the yeah, even the guys are eye candy, or at least one of them. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I was like, yeah. So no, this is this is uh, this is a great one. So look, of Eric Roberts um, points because of course now it's it, this is going to be difficult because it stars the great man. I know, right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and give this one three out of five, Eric Roberts, because ah. it's watchable, but it's not a masterpiece. <laughs> but well, it does have that rewatch factor. You could- Yes. Everyone just watch this again for a laugh. Yeah. It's, if you, yeah, I mean, look, I, I almost want to give it two scores. If, if, mm-hmm. like, for me, if you wanted to just rate this as a creature feature, you know, movie, then I'll, I'll seriously, I could only give it about two. But if you want to treat this as a creature feature dark comedy, which is really what it is, then I would give it five because it just ticks every box. Yeah, that's so, totally right. Um, that totally makes sense. You yeah, know, no, so right. I suppose I'll split the difference and call it, what's that, three and a half or something? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. three and a half Eric's, I reckon. And maybe I'll go to four because <laughs> it's got Eric Roberts in it. <laughs> yeah. then, I already, then I already know we have to rate our next movie because <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah I, look the whole truth is that whenever I it's the other thing I should actually say to listeners is that my scoring is related to what I think of that movie at that time. It's not right. meant to be a comparison from movie to movie. Please That's don't, a good point. Yeah, yeah, please don't ever think yeah. if I give one movie five and another three, I'm actually trying to compare them in any way because I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. It just comes down to how much enjoyment <laughs> I got watching that movie. Yeah, yeah, it's a really fun movie. I mean, for fuck's sake, we call it the Eric Roberts scale. How serious can it be? <laughs> <laughs> 
can't, I, I, I can't wait till he comes on our show one day and he finds out what our oh, will that, will, will that be, is, will that be our dream? That? He'll be honored. He'll be honored. Oh, that, that's just and we'll my dream. And we'll be like, well, now we can't, you know, use him. We can't use him as a rating skill if he comes on the show. So we better discuss off air our backup rating skill for when Eric Roberts comes on one we day. Could, we could use his sister. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> <laughs> how do you reckon no, that would go down? I don't think he would like that. I no, I don't think he like would either. No, I know. I don't think he'd like that at all. Because <laughs> then it's going to be like, oh, so you're going to use me to rate the shitty movies and my sister, sister? to rate the good ones? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> like, no, 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 Eric. We didn't mean it that way. Come back, Eric. Damn it. Oh. We finally got him on the show and we blew it. Oh, I know. So, no, like- <laughs> it's... This is one of my dreams in life is to have is to have Eric on the, on the show. You know, what uh, happens someday? It'll be so awesome. So yeah, we got to start thinking about that uh, replacement but, rating scale for when he comes yes. on. <laughs> but um, but I do know that I think we were talking during the week, Velvet, about doing an Eric Roberts special. Yeah, we're actually going to do that next week. Yeah, and that's pretty exciting. And the, one of the movies we're absolutely doing is Eyes of Roshi. And this is an independent film that actually reached out to us. They actually sent us a formal email and they sent us a a formal screening invitation. And just by law of attraction, (laughs) it turns out that Eric Roberts is also in this movie. And we're like, oh, that's perfect. So I was like, oh, that's perfect. So we're going to do an Eric Roberts special. We're going to talk about this film, Eyes of Roshi, that came out this year. And then we're going to pick two other Eric Roberts. So oh, this film is still in discussions to still to be decided. <laughs> so if anyone if anyone out there has a favorite Eric Roberts film, let us know. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, mm-hmm. you know, let us know. But remember, do it pretty quick. Don't <laughs> you know? Don't exactly. don't tell us in seven days. You know, tell us tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but um, but definitely because we'll you know we'll we'll listen to that and uh, and I think for the screening, um, I definitely think it's it's Tuxedo and Little Black Dress. I think. I mean, yes, you, you absolutely, know, yeah, I absolutely. Mean, and one glass of champagne. Don't drink more than one glass of bubbly, or you might not remember the movie. So yeah. I'll remember that. Or, <laughs> we got to be on our best. We got to be on our best behavior here. Okay, I'll, I'll just eat. I'll just eat the donuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, the donuts soak up the alcohol. See, that's the trick. <laughs> oh, that's okay. No, that's true. That's very true. All right, we'll take a quick break, uh, and we promise that we will actually talk about the next movie rather. Than- <laughs> Then get so off track. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with our third movie. Oh, we are just careening off the track. This is going to be a long edit. Oh, God. that's staying in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Only Funny to Us podcast with brand new episodes every Monday night at 8 at OnlyFunnyToUs.com. Now, and oh, I just realized, Velvet, I played the same advert for Only Funny to Us twice. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, do you want uh, to, oh, I guess you can't change it. <laughs> I can't change it now. Um, sorry about that, guys. Um, listen, we, they've sent us a whole heap of new adverts, and I just played the wrong ones. So my apologies, Di. I'll, I'll fix it up next week. Um, anyway, never mind. Um, <laughs> so anyway, our third of the, 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 the joys of podcasting. <laughs> totally. Um, totally. The, uh, now, our third movie. Uh, for this uh, podcast, this is one that I knew absolutely nothing about, uh, and I am so glad that I have now seen it. I really, really have enjoyed this film, and it's called I Know You're In There um, from 2016, uh, directed by uh, what was it, uh, Robert Lawson Gordon. Uh, I think mm-hmm. it's, an, it's an American, uh, what would we say, uh, independent uh, yes, this movie? is an independent horror film. As far as I know, this hasn't really been screened in theaters. It's available pretty much exclusively online. And uh, we'll tell everyone where you can find it um, in a minute. But uh, we'll talk about the uh, the movie first. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a horror suspense, uh, mm-hmm. I suppose, is the best way to describe it. And it stars our main character. Uh, Tom and his girlfriend Jamie, uh, who are a, a young couple. Uh, she's a school teacher, and he's uh, sort of a, a growing independent filmmaker. And yes. um, uh, he, um, st- <laughs> what's that? Well, I should say, it's quite funny how this movie starts with him actually just videotaping his girlfriend's tits. Uh, but. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, the beginning of this movie is really unexpected. It's it's, like, it doesn't waste any time getting into the story. No, like for half a second, they're just goofing off, but then it goes like right into the. Oh, story. but then it gets yeah. more serious because he then gets a phone call uh, to find out that his mother uh, has uh, committed suicide, and uh, he learns that he has a sister that he never knew about, which is not really explained. Because I would have thought. But anyway, it's it's not really crucial to the plot. Um, who is and she is called Chloe, but Chloe has a um, uh, very serious catatonic schizophrenic. Yeah, so very <laughs> serious mental health issues. So she can't walk, she can't talk, uh, she can't move, uh, she mm-hmm. can't feed herself, she can't can't do anything. So she basically mm-hmm. lives in either a bed or in a wheelchair, and. Mm-hmm. Um, he decides that he will take responsibility uh, for her, much though the doctor uh, in this movie says that he shouldn't, but he decides to take her away to uh, his mother's old house where they used to live, which is mm-hmm. like this cabin in the woods, isn't it, is uh, the best way to describe it. And then... More like cabin in the mountains. In the mountains, <laughs> yes. And, uh, and then things start to go... Well, this is where our horror suspense element comes in. And that is that, can Chloe move? Can Chloe really speak? Is she pretending? Is she faking it? Yeah, Uh. or not. And um, he he starts to question, um, you know, this from certain things that start to happen, such as things starting to move uh, in the house where he knows he hasn't moved it. So who's moved it? There's only the two of them there. He then starts to hear voices outside in the wilderness, but there's nobody around. Um, We then start to see some things happen, which are not really explainable. Um, His girlfriend, Jamie, then comes up to join them. And then some serious shit starts to happen. And it's, it's almost (laughs) like, you know, it it almost turns into the shining. Um, it's a very interesting film that I really enjoyed. Mm hmm. Yeah. I have a three letters for this movie. W O W. Really original storytelling. Uh, God, the music kept building suspense. Spence, just this oh it just i really this was one of those movies where i kept thinking and i'm not usually this way i usually sit back and relax and enjoy the movie but with this movie i kept going oh they're going to do this aren't they and then it would do something else i'm like oh okay oh they're going to do this just when i thought the story was getting predictable it wasn't and i was like i really enjoyed that it kept so surprising me it wasn't so much a little bit of twists here and there but it wasn't like you know, break your neck twist. It was just like, kind of like, oh, you thought this was going to happen, didn't you? But no, we're doing this with this story. This is what we're doing, not that. <laughs> and oh, I was just like, it, I know. it kept me engaged. Yeah, it kept me engaged. I really liked it. It's, yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I mean, I didn't really know what to expect going into this. Uh, but I'm, but once it started going, I couldn't stop watching. You know, I mm-hmm. really, really wanted to know what was going on. Um, you know, could was Chloe faking it and could she actually move? Um, or, you know, was Tom, the character of Tom, himself going insane? Um, mm-hmm. and, and if Tom was going insane, why was he going insane? What was it about where they lived and about Chloe that could do that to him? Mm-hmm. But... You know, it was just, there was so much going on. And I even thought this movie, like, because like I said, you keep watching it and you keep thinking, oh, okay, this is mental illness. Then you're like, oh, no, no, this is just, this person's crazy. Like, this person's evil crazy. Then you're like, no, this is actually supernatural. This is like a demon or or something. And, you know, like, you kept thinking, oh, it's going to going to be this oh it's going to be this and it was always something else <laughs> well, it's, it, well, this and is, even at yeah. the end of the movie i'm not going to give away the end but even at the end of the movie i'm not 100 percent sure i know what's going on <laughs> well it, it's it, it's to me and I, I don't want to give too much away because this is one we obviously do what we don't want to tell the ending to um, right right definitely but, but it, it's you, this movie can like you never quite know as this movie is as you said before is this a, a supernatural movie Mm-hmm. Um, or is this a story of mental illness? Like mm-hmm. we, we never really know. Um, is there? Is it that she is supernatural? Like Chloe, our character, is, is she supernaturally possessed, or is the character of Tom 
fallen into a state of schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. And and the problem is we never really know. And even when we get towards the end of the film, we think, oh, right, that was what it was. Okay, and I'm not going to say what it is. Exactly. But, I, know but, you're saying, I know exactly what you're think, talking oh, about. But then they twist again. And then it twists twist again. again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's it's it really is it, – it's very good. I mean, there are – I won't say that there are – uh, sort of jump out of your seat moments in this, but there are a couple of bits in it where you sort of go, "Oh my god, did I just see that? Did that just happen?" Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. Yeah, what so, the fuck was that? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 more suspense rather than scare the shit out of you. It it just right. it's continual Although I did suspense. Have one really bad jump scare, but that's not much coming for me. I'm really easy to jump scare. All right, okay. <laughs> But there was one where I jumped way too hard, and I was like, whoa, and I was like, oh, that scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I'll have to remember that. Never walk up behind you and clap oh, my God, hands really loud. Right. Oh, no. You might get a, you might get a elbow to the stomach. Be careful. <laughs> 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 it's but, happened. So, but, uh, yeah, no, this was, um, this movie did really great attention to detail with the character of Chloe, because a lot of times when we deal with characters that are kind of you know catatonic or vegetable like characters that don't move don't talk it, a lot of detail gets skipped and in this one they didn't they like wanted to make it really, really clear to the audience like they showed everything but the pacing on this was really good like they showed that she she couldn't eat by herself they showed that she had to have physical therapy exercises every day they showed that she had a restroom schedule she had to keep or she was going to piss herself and also, they even showed that she had to be bathed. Like, n- literally, she could do nothing yeah. herself. And they did a really good pacing of showing how the protagonist, Tom in this, who I actually really liked, actually, um, that he had – they showed you a lot about Tom without telling you a lot. Like, you figure out really quickly that this guy obviously has a sense of humor and that um, he has a drinking problem. And so you, you have to keep these things in mind. And he's a very sympathetic protagonist because he really, you know, okay, I, honestly, if I were in Tom's situation, if I all of a sudden found out that I had a sibling that I never knew existed and Tom was an only child, I'm an only child. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> if that happened to me, I would be like, okay, I'm going to come visit. But he was like, no, I'm going to move this girl into my house and I'm going to do everything for her and take care of her because he said he wanted to get to know her. And even the doctor's like, this is it. You know, she doesn't talk. She doesn't speak. She doesn't interact. It's like, you know, it's not that she can't. I mean, she doesn't communicate at all. This is it. And he still wanted to take that responsibility and take care of her. And so, like, you really started to like him as a character because you saw him dedicating his entire Ah, day. Well. To taking care of her. See, that's really interesting because I saw it slightly differently, um, mm-hmm. where I actually saw him as a bit of a user. Because well, I, well, you find that out later. Yeah, you find that out later. Well, exactly. No, well, it just no. I mean, even from the start, because mm-hmm. for me, I don't think that he originally wanted to be with her so much to bond to try to rebuild what was left of his family. I actually mm-hmm. think that he was just using her to make a movie. Like he couldn't, mm-hmm. he couldn't work out what his movie was going to be about, be about, mm, and then okay. suddenly he was given this opportunity, like this gift of the gods, and mm-hmm. suddenly, oh, here's my movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but- I thought that, yeah, I thought that after a while when I realized, oh, he's making a documentary of, oh, look, I have a sister I never knew I had. Not only do I have a sister, but she has catatonic schizophrenia and I have to do everything for her. Like, yeah, I, my opinion did change when, once I started realizing it. I didn't realize it as soon as you did, though. <laughs> Oh, it's just, I, I just, there were certain things, um, uh, certain comments he would make to um, uh, to Jamie, his girlfriend, which I sort mm-hmm. of thought, uh, because it it's, um, I mean, I actually see her as more of the caring character, actually, rather than him. Yeah, uh, but, no, you're right about that. You know, uh, but but then again, you know, it's like all of these stories, we often see different things. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we don't always, you know, see the exact thing. But it's um, but watching his um, change in personality over the movie is it's really good acting. You know, he uh, yeah. the, the character that he starts playing is not the same character he's playing. You know, towards the end of the film, he is right. He's become a different. Per- he is a different character. So yeah. he actually, and, and but the beauty of it, because he's changing the character 
you know, all throughout the film, it just shows how good of an actor he was that we almost don't notice the change until we suddenly realize, holy shit, it's not the same person anymore. Exactly. Yeah, that's a very um, good setup in this movie, too. Like, the whole creepy atmosphere. Like, um, first off, I love the location that they shot this movie in. Um, and they mention it in the movie is Mount Shasta in California, which is Northern California. It's very mountainous, very woodsy. It's very beautiful. And they mention that in the movie and it's also very isolated. So I'm like, okay, that's a really good setup. And just the way they introduce the characters, like, okay, Tom doesn't really have any family, doesn't know his mother. Now he finds out he has a sister and he has to do everything for the sister and the way they really flesh these characters out without telling you too much about them um i really like the actress that they chose for the chloe character which oh, is she was fantastic wasn't she good she's first off she's really pretty and i'm this sounds uh may sound a little shallow a little superficial but i love that they chose such a beautiful actress to play her character because yeah. they could have gone either way they could have chosen somebody not so attractive and then that's the face of mental illness is the person who's a total mess and i like that they gave her a very dignified beautiful appearance even though she wasn't able to take care of herself because of her you know mental illness and but also even though basically for, for the movie you know she's sitting in a wheelchair doing nothing you can see a change in her throughout the movie too like in the beginning her face is expressionless then over time you notice she seems to have a little bit of a smirk on her yes, face. Is she smirking? Yes. Is she smirking? And then after a while, she has this just look of either like evil or mean or disdain, just like something not nice. And I'm like, wow, this is really great character acting that she's, you know, conveying this emotion without really being given free reign to move or talk or do anything. So uh, shout out to the actress that plays Chloe Redding in this movie. Loved her. So her name oh, is yeah. Grain McDermott. So Grain McDermott. So I got to be on the lookout for anything else she might be in because yes. she did this role really well. Oh, most definitely. She was, she was, I mean, she was my favorite, I would have to say. Um, mm -hmm. Although when I say favorite, it's just that the role she played was so amazing. Yeah. But, but yeah. all the cast in this are actually really good. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they all play their roles really well. They, they're all very believable. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, there's, um, and, and even when you see fear, you really can see fear, you know, yes, uh, yes. Uh, but you can also see the concept that because they're all a family, they may have fear of each other, but then there's still in the background a love of each other. So there's mm -hmm. this conflict between uh, terror and love running simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, and we definitely get to see that in um, Jamie's character, you know, towards the end, you definitely. know, where, where she's conflicted by the fact that she's, terrified by what's happening around her but she still loves these people so right it's it's and yeah i didn't like her character at first so basically uh tom's girlfriend because i mean like in the very beginning like she calls uh she calls Chloe crazy. She says yeah. she's creepy. And then, like, she's even condescending towards her boyfriend at one point. She's like, what are you filming? I mean, seriously. And I was just like, oh, I don't like this lady. But then, you know, that changes over time. And I'm like, okay, now I see things from her point of view. And <laughs> now I can kind yeah. of get where she's coming from. And I'm a little more tolerant, especially the way movie the movie shifts quite a bit as you're watching it. You know, because it starts off one way and you think that's what's going to be but then it turns into something else. You're like, oh, that's where this is going. But then something else happens and you're like, oh, okay. So it's not like, it's not like M. Night Shyamalan type surprises. Like, did you, did we yeah. did you? Did you? Like, it's not, it's actually, it's, uh, it's not subtle, but it's more gracefully done is what I want to say. Well, like a really good, intriguing story because it uh, keeps having those mood changes because you're like, is it, is this a thriller? Is this horror? Is this supernatural? Is it psychological? Like, it's really, it really keeps you guessing. Well, it, it's, in some ways, I actually think Jamie's almost us, the audience. Um, you know, like, because, I mean, you put yourself into that situation where you find out that you've got a relative. Um, they're the only relative you've got left in the world, but mm -hmm. they're severely mentally handicapped. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, how would you handle it? It's a bit like you sort of said, would you just let them live their two lives separate, but you would still visit you know, yeah, I'd be the visitor. You, yeah, I'm not or, moving you in. 
you, you know, are not coming to live <laughs> with me. Sorry, no. And, 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 <laughs> and, and in the sense that Jamie sort of has that view, you know, she can't really understand why he wants to do all of this. But mm-hmm. then later in the film, we sort of realise that, you know, she's actually very kind-hearted. She starts to bond. Mm-hmm. She really does care. And, in fact, um, uh, she becomes central to the whole plot towards the end or about what is going to happen what to our big finale because, you know, she's crucial to that uh, because of, you know, this idea we played with before, you know, is this a story of mental illness or is this a story of almost demon possession? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and, uh, and all, as we said earlier, all the way through, we never know because one minute we think it's demon possession. Then mm-hmm. the next minute we think it's mental illness. Then we go mm-hmm. back to being demon possession again. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's, it just keeps you, you know, held all the way through. Yeah, I really love it. And like I said, like not only, okay, so we're like, is it supernatural? Is it demon possession? Is it mental illness? And again, I was like, or is it just the dark side of humanity? Because I was just like, is this just somebody who's trying to pull one over on people and they're just not a good person? They're just inherently evil. Because that was like another thing that I was just like, wow, is that what's going on? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But I I think, Uh, but I I think there's, there's no doubt that through the character of Tom, we Mm -hmm. start to view what happened to his mother. In other words, Mm -hmm. why his mother committed suicide, because there are certain things in the house, such as chains on doors and um, Mm -hmm. religious symbols and and, and all this sort of stuff that doesn't Mm -hmm. make any sense. But -hmm. then as the movie starts to progress, we start to understand why those symbols are there, why the chains are there. And, you know, and, 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 but then again, we don't actually know, if they're necessary or not, because mm-hmm. it's, it's like, as we said, the story keeps ebbing and flowing, changing all the time. One minute we think we know why it's there. And the next minute we think, Oh no, we don't. But then the next minute we think, Oh, maybe I got that wrong. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, no, they did this really well too, because there's so many movies that try to have like twist endings and they try to have, um, um, twists and turns and they fell miserably because they could just come out of nowhere or they it's just put in there too suddenly too hard there's no transition there's no warning there's no lead up it doesn't make any sense and this movie blended all those qualities really well because like I said for one moment they I thought they were going to lose me and I'm like oh they're doing that I'm like, okay, I mean, that's cool. But now, you know, I felt like I already knew how the movie was going to end. And I'm like, uh, but I was like, no, you're not done watching the movie. Keep watching. And then they surprised <laughs> me again. And I was like, oh, well, see, I don't know shit. I'm glad I kept watching. You know, because <laughs> this movie, it, this movie is telling the story, not me. So I need to, you know, sit back and relax because enjoy the ride because they've got a great story to tell. <laughs> well, the other thing, too, is that we talked about how this is filmed in the mountains and um but it also talks at the very start i think that they talk about um native american religion um mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. you know whether there's also a connection with the fact that they're living in what was you know almost what we would call in australia a sacred site uh mm-hmm. in other words you know a, a piece of land which is the equivalent to an indigenous culture to what a white christian would call a church you know it's like mm-hmm. and so are have they invaded this what is really holy land and exactly so, um, and i i love know. that they included that because that's actual local mythology to uh, mount shasta's area so i love that they actually included that in the area kind of like because you did have that in the back of your mind for a second that oh maybe they are invading sacred ground and this is what happens <laughs> yes <laughs> when you go yeah yes it's a bit like you know if you go and uh, i suppose in christian culture tear down a church and then go and plant a house on top of it mm-hmm. um you know i mean we, you know it, it, we made the world has made how many hundreds of thousands of horror movies about that subject mm-hmm. uh, but so yeah so this plays the same way if you're going to go and plot a house right in the middle of the equivalent of an indigenous american holy site um mm-hmm. yeah so but the other thing too um, um i found out was apparently they all lived in the actual house they filmed it in yeah, but for they, three weeks. Yeah, three weeks. Yeah. So it's all filmed on location, on site. You know, this is there's no um, this film hasn't been done where the outside shots were on location, but the inside shots were all filmed back in Los Angeles. This was actually filmed in the house, all on location, and I think that just adds to it. 
you know? Oh, totally, totally. Yeah, this is a really well-made movie. It really surprised me, and I'm happy that we're talking about an independent film because this independent film deserves all the attention it can get. It only just released last month on the 20th, so it literally just came out like a month ago. So, yeah, it needs all the help it can get, and I'm glad we're talking about it. Well, when you, when you think about, you know, that pile of excretion called The Room, uh, you know, that we, <laughs> we, we spoke about on an earlier, you know, which, which, um, which costs $6 million to make. Now, I mean, mm. I, I don't know what the budget was on this, but this is like comparing cream to cat sick. You know, this movie <laughs> is so good. You know, um, it really is. It, it's good. I mean, when you watch this, you really, I think you would have sort of thought that this was a low budget mainstream release. You mm-hmm. wouldn't actually, you, uh, you wouldn't actually think that this is a totally independent film, you mm-hmm. know, if, if you didn't know anything about it. Uh, yeah, very well it's, made. It's, it's that very good. well yeah. made. Yeah, very well made. Yeah, and the acting, again, uh, supreme, really great acting in this movie. And and the cinematography too. I mean, you can mm-hmm. you can feel the atmosphere, you can feel the cold, you can feel the house sort of being a bit creepy and a bit, you know, it's like they really were able to carry off those emotions within the cinematography too, I thought. Oh, and the music in this movie was really good at building the tension and the way they did the glitches with the music as well as the glitches with the scenery while you're watching. Because parts of the movie are for like half a second found footage is what it yeah. comes across. At first, I thought it was actually going to be a found footage movie, but it's not so much a found footage movie as in um, he's reviewing what he's filmed. So it's not really found footage, but uh, he's, you know, trying to film stuff, trying to get proof and he'll like review the footage and, you know, tr- <laughs> and well, you have to watch the movie to see what he sees when he reviews the yeah, footage. It's, it's and- <laughs> a bit like, and also, um, and also, I'm sorry, really quick, the beeping of his watch. Cause uh, Chloe oh, is on such a strict yeah. schedule with her feeding and her cleaning and her physical rehabilitation and her bedtime, like all that. So constantly his watch is going off and that puts you on edge because you feel like you're late for something or you feel like something's going to happen. And at one point in the movie, he gets lost in like the mountainous area slash woods outside the house and the beeping of his watch keeps going off and then the mu- music's building at the same time and it was making me nervous. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. I know exactly what you meant. Um, it was like you hear his watch go off and it's like, quick, you got to get back. you got to get back. Um, I, I started to feel so sorry for her, just left alone in this exactly. house. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, they that definitely carries through. Well, one thing I was going to say when you mentioned the, the found footage element, this the movie that this sort of most reminds me of in some degrees, although these movies have nothing to do with each other, they're not the same in any way, but <laughs> – if you liked a movie that we reviewed a number of podcasts ago called The Blair Witch Project, The Book of Shadows, which mm. was the follow-up movie to the original Blair Witch Project, um, mm-hmm. which, of course, was shot very differently because it was shot as a mainstream movie and so forth. But um, but it had all that stuff where they would keep reviewing the footage all the time to see what had just happened. So you an event would happen and then they'd look in the camera and see what happened and they were seeing something totally different. And this movie is very much like the Book of Shadows. It's um, uh, So we can see something happen and then five minutes later we can see it reviewed on footage and it's something totally different. And and that's where all that idea about is, you know, is some demon playing with us or are we going insane? What is it? You know, and exactly. um, I love how it adds you know. to that layer of storytelling. And it, and the funny thing is, without spoiling it, I'll just say, even though you review the footage, you're still not 100% sure what's going on. That's right. <laughs> That's right. The flicker. Um, it's which you'll know what I mean when you watch the movie. Um, it's, it, it's, yeah, look, it, it's, it's great. I, 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 this one, I definitely, you know, full thumbs up. Um, if we're going to rate this one, Velvet, how would you, you know, where would it fall? Oh, this is definitely five Eric's out of five Eric's. <laughs> yeah. Five out of five Eric's, definitely. Yeah, I, I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to give it five as well, because uh, it's it, it, be, simply because um, if this was a mainstream production, I'd probably maybe give it three. 
But because this is an independent movie and because of what they had to work with, I'm giving it five. Because they, a small budget independent movie, and this thing seriously to be shown in cinemas and you'd walk out feeling very satisfied. So most definitely, I'll give it a five. Yeah, definitely. If you were able to see this in a a mainstream movie theater, you would definitely be like, oh, I got my money's worth. So since this is an independent film and they need all the support that you can give, if you really want to watch this movie, go check out their website. It's actually I know you're in there movie.com and there you can actually pick your choice of streaming method. They're available on iTunes, Amazon and Google Play. So go show your support for independent filmmakers. I know you're in there movie.com if you want to watch the film. Oh, and you can also follow them on their social media, which will also be linked on their website. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. No, I, I say to everyone, definitely, this is, um, I mean, we review a lot of movies here that seriously, we don't expect half of you to actually go out and watch. Uh, but this is one that I would actually say to people, seriously, go and check it out. Um, you know, if you like, absolutely. if you like horror absolutely. suspense, seriously, you'll enjoy this. I, you know, uh, yeah, no, most definitely. I, I can't speak, you know, all I can do is give this movie praise. Absolutely. Yeah, this actually caught me by surprise because I wanted to see it because I watched their trailer and I was kind of like, oh, this actually looks pretty good. But I honestly thought, you know, it's going to be an independent film. It's probably going to be a pretty predictable story. The acting's probably going to be mediocre. I just, for some reason, I just did not have high expectations for this film and it totally surpassed all my expectations and um, Warren and I have discussed doing towards the end of the year, we're going to do our, you know, best three films of the year that we've reviewed together. Yep. And I have a feeling this one's going to take a spot. <laughs> oh, most definitely. Most definitely. <laughs> no promises. Anything yeah, can change I, I, in the I next can't... couple of weeks. But <laughs> I, I feel like this one's a contender. <laughs> I, I can't see. Uh, the thing is, I can't make fun of this film. You know, I can't laugh at this film. It's, it's, it's too good. You know that's yeah. that that uh, yeah. that's the thing. It's it, it's like um, uh, I know that um, uh, Gary and I in an earlier podcast talked about a movie called uh, uh, Pontypool from Canada, and mm-hmm. and when I I first um, saw it, I sort of thought, oh, I've I've got a feeling I'm this is a movie I'm just going to have to watch, not because mm-hmm. I really want to watch it, but it, I, I know it's going to be a piece of shit, and <laughs> but. As soon as that movie, oh, about 15 minutes into that movie, I was so hooked. I, you know, it, that uh, like Pontypool, just one of the best movies I've seen out of Canada forever. Just so good. And, and, I know and this, exactly what you're talking about. I've seen that movie, and it's a really original piece of storytelling. Oh, yeah. It, it was mm-hmm. so good. And, and I think, um, you know, I know you're in there. For me, was much the same. I went into mm-hmm. this not really expecting a lot. You know, I sort mm-hmm. of thought, oh, it's going to be cheap and it's going to be, you know, I still love independent cinema, but I sort of, you know, so often the stories aren't very good or they're really pretentious or, you know. <laughs> exactly. But, but this wasn't at all. This just, I couldn't believe for, for what this thing cost, it just kept me there on the edge of my seat, you know. I, I, it was, mm-hmm. it was, oh, yeah, just brilliant. Absolutely Absolutely. Brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Well, I think we've sort of come to an end. Yeah, an definitely. End for- oh, this was a fun episode. We had a lot of silly stuff, a lot of funny stuff, and then we surprised you guys with a legitimate film review. How do you like that? <laughs> oh, no. Well, I suppose we had to we had to do it once. Every once in a while. <laughs> I know. No, but it's it, it's the thing. It's like if if you're not a movie with yeah, I mean, if you're going to talk about Shark to Puss and you're going to you know and, and um you know and some of the other pieces of you know excrement that we've actually talked about, <laughs> I, I mean, Siri, you can't. Can't take it seriously, you know. But but then again, life is about living. Life is about you know having fun. And and for me, it's always been that sometimes you know you can walk into a cinema or you can hop onto your iTunes or you can go and buy a Blu-ray. You know, whatever your way of watching films is. And sometimes you want to watch something and be highly moved. Sometimes you want to be educated. Sometimes you just want to see an amazing story told in such a beautiful or amazing way. But sometimes you just want to switch off and forget about the world and have some fun for an hour and a half, you know, and and that's why movies like Shark to Puss are important. 
Absolutely. No, uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, I was literally going to say what you said word for word, but you beat me to it. No, oh, <laughs> you know, sorry. I'm, 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 just, I'm just the loud mouth Aussie, you see. We always, we always no, jump in there first. There's, there's, I love every type of genre. I love film just for the sake of entertainment to make you laugh. I love thought-provoking cinema. And I love artistic cinema, which something you and I are going to have to touch on in the the future because that's always very a very mixed bag some people can't handle those kind of films at all some people cannot handle watching a movie that is just basically there for you to watch and experience and it doesn't really have like a straight plot it doesn't really have a lot of stuff that makes sense and there's a film I want us to review in the future, and I'm curious to see what your thoughts will be on it, but we'll talk about that off air. <laughs> oh, oh, we're going to keep it a secret, okay? <laughs> yeah, keep it a secret for keep now. Keep it a secret. Oh, so. well, I have to admit, the list of movies we've got is just growing and growing and growing. Oh, my God, it's insane. And, and there's some really good suggestions on there, and there's, oh, my God, there's one we were going to review soon that I, like, I can't wait to review it because before I saw The Room... I used to call this movie the worst movie I'd ever seen. Uh, and it, I know and what you're it, talking so about. It, and it cracks me up because there's a lot of people that have been, or not a lot, but there's been a few people that have been requesting it. And they're like, we love this movie. And I'm yeah. like, oh, my God, that is the worst movie I'd ever seen before I saw The Room. <laughs> and I'm just <laughs> like, so we have to review this to well, see if I still feel this way well, after seeing The Room. <laughs> we, we are getting... We are getting a lot of requests, aren't we? Through the yeah, mainly we're getting through some the, really the great Twitter ones. page. And, yeah, and I'm loving that uh, people that do independent films are reaching out to us. Please continue to do so. We're happy to support you and help you spread the word on your art. And we're honored that you trust us with your medium. And also, really love hearing from the short people too. <laughs> from the short, the short films, people. <laughs> <From> the- <laughs> So yeah, so just remember if you're not if you're under four foot three, you, you can't you can't message Velvet, all right? She's into short, short guys. Short guys, okay? You must be this tall to ride Velvet. No, yeah. but uh, no, but uh, short film producers, short film actors, uh, short film makers, please feel free to tweet us, contact us, email us as well, uh, and we're happy to check it, check out your art and spread the word when we can. So. Oh, a- absolutely! Look, um, it, it's like yeah, even though we'll come up with a better title than you yeah, know, we send, will. A, send us your send us your short film, um, but um, uh, but no, but most definitely, you know, if you if you send it to us, we'll watch it and we'll talk about it without any doubt. So, uh, uh, so no, I'm looking forward to that. That's that's going to be lots of fun in the future. Um, so, all right, I think that's that's pretty much a wrap. Uh, so, uh, so remember, um, uh, you can follow this show at. Uh, oh, actually, you I'm, know what? I'm going to let you do all the the, the shout outs. Actually, to <laughs> okay. be honest, because no because I should let everybody know, Velvet has been so amazing because. I don't know if, if everyone out there realises, but she's pretty much doing 99.9% of the social media work for us at the moment. And <laughs> and I just publicly want to say thank you. You know, oh. you've been doing so much work and, um, you know, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> So, so but yeah. All joking aside, go ahead and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Cult Movie Show. Phil, and also in there, you'll have our contact info. You can either email us, tweet us, or private messages. Any suggestions or invite to movie screenings, or if you want us to check out your short movie, <laughs> not yes. how tall you are. But <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and do that. If you want to get to know me personally a little more, you can follow me on my social media. But please be eighteen or older because I do post adult content you can follow me at omg it's velvet and also my co-host martini super dry warren here you can yeah, check him out me. also that's on me Twitter guys <laughs> martini <laughs> super dry <So> yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right we want to say thank you to our friends over at only funny to us podcast so you can also follow them on twitter only funny to us and also thank you alana evans for providing the music for the end of our show uh warren i think you're out of the job I yeah i'm not needed now. anymore i'll just <laughs> I'll, I'll just turn i'll just turn up each weekend and just push the buttons you know <laughs> <laughs> i'm out of a job oh well uh where, where's the where, where's the closest labor exchange uh, 
<laughs> no, that that was really great fun. So that was that I can't believe that was number twenty. That was podcast yeah. twenty. It was, yeah, it was great. A great episode. And, uh, this uh, definitely has a lot of re-listen value as well. So I'm going to give this episode also five out of five Eric's. Oh, perfect. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So thanks for listening, guys. We'll, of course, be back next week with uh, Podcast 21. And uh, so remember, we're always basically broadcasting at this. Well, when I say broadcasting, we're podcasting uh, at the same time. So the show will always go up. Depending a little bit on where you live, uh, it's uh, uh, probably around about 3 or 4 a.m. if you live in Western Europe. Uh, but if you're in the United States, it's probably more sort of uh, late Saturday night, probably mid-afternoon mm-hmm. if you live in Asia uh, or Australia. Uh, so, right. But remember, it's a podcast, so... You know, all the links are on Twitter, and if you subscribe to us on iTunes, you're going to get that little ding come up to let you know that the new podcast's up anyway. So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll be back um, next week with Podcast 21 and our Eric Roberts special. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Woohoo! <laughs> so, send, so send us in any, um, any requests if you've got them for the Eric Roberts special. Cool. Thanks, Velvet. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we'll leave you, as always, with uh, Alana Evans and Perfect. <laughs>